you the look of You're alive. possibility. Okay. Um, all right. Well, last week we looked at um, the seven prayers in the Lord's Prayer, and uh, this one's kind of connected with that one. Um, it's kind of like, I guess, part two of the prayer. And so the second thing I wanted to look at was just some of, some lessons that Jesus teaches on prayer. Um, so for the first one, um, all of these will be taken from um, the examples that Jesus gives in the Gospels. Uh, not that the rest of the Bible doesn't have anything to say on prayer. We're just focusing on what Jesus can teach us, um, or some of the things Jesus can teach us. So the first thing is keep asking. If you look in Matthew chapter 26, and the second lesson will also be from Matthew 26, so you might as well turn there. Matthew chapter 26, starting in verse 39. And he went a little beyond them, and fell on his face and prayed, saying, My father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. <coughs> now remember, this is Jesus speaking. Okay. And it says that he goes back to his disciples, and they're sleeping, so he wakes up and says, Couldn't you just stay awake? Then in verse 42 it says, um, He went away again a second time and prayed, saying, My father, if this cannot pass away unless I drink it, your will be done. And then, again, he goes back to his disciples. Now, in verse 44, And he left them again and went away and prayed a third time, saying the same thing once again. Okay. Now, I think that sometimes we skip over this too quickly. This is Jesus. Remember, Jesus is God. Jesus is praying, and what, what does he say here? Three times he says the exact same thing. He prays the exact same thing. Now, I think this is extremely important. Because... He didn't have a one-and-done prayer. Sometimes we think we just pray about it and we, we let it go. That's exactly the opposite of what we see in the Bible. And Jesus himself, God himself, showed us the example by praying the exact same thing three times in the same night. Chances are this was in the span of like, what, 20, 30 minutes? <laughs> I mean, this isn't, this isn't like it's taken a real long time. So y you, can, you can figure out there, you know, if, if Jesus... Prayed for the exact same thing within that short of a period of time. When we pray for stuff, do you think we should just pray and let it go, or should we pray and keep on praying? See what I mean? And I think that that's definitely something that Jesus teaches us there that we definitely sometimes just skip over. You're like, oh, I know this story, you know, and so we just kind of read through it. But I think that it's important that it mentions very, very specifically that he prayed the same thing again. So he wanted to make sure he knew what he was going through. So when in and done prayers, now, I want you to catch this. They accomplish little and often nothing. When you pray for something once and then just drop the whole thing, usually if they do accomplish anything, it's not much. Rather, the example we see in the Bible is when people just take stuff to God and they keep, they keep trusting him, him with it, keep taking it to him, keep trusting him with it over and over again. You know, you see a bigger reward from that. And, um, so. We see what it does. Right. So it is not leaving it in God's hands, it is disobeying. Now, I want to kind of clarify what I'm saying here. It's good to leave stuff in God's hands. You know, like if you're, if you're worrying about something, to trust it to God. And I'm, I'm not knocking that. But what I am saying is sometimes we're lazy with our prayer. And we just say, oh, I'm just trusting in God's hands. No, you're disobeying God because He told you to pray, to stay in prayer about it instead of. Being diligent in prayer, you don't want to pray about it anymore, so you just haven't. <laughs> so, I mean, there's a difference between leaving it in God's hands and being lazy with your prayers. You know, if you're praying like once a week or once every two or three weeks about something like, oh, it's bothering me, I'll pray about it in a couple weeks. That's kind of what I'm talking about. That's not obeying. You can say, <laughs> Whoever I am. You can keep praying until he, until he answers you. You just okay. keep going. Okay. okay. <laughs> and, uh, in Jesus' case, the answer, I mean, the, the answer was kind of a matter of time. Right. You just wait long enough and you're going to be dead, you know? <laughs> but yeah, I kind of pray to get the job done. Yeah. Pray and keep on praying. <laughs> kind of like that mindset. And uh, I think that Jesus knew when it was time to move on because the, after the last time, he goes back to his disciples and he says, it doesn't matter now anymore. Anymore, here come my captors. 
you know, and he gets, he gets arrested at that very time. So it seems like he knew. Now, obviously, um, you know, it doesn't say whether he was praying while they were leading him away or not. But the point still remains. So, anyways, um, we, re repeated prayers are not about mindless repetition but heartfelt desire. Sometimes people have this idea that if I just say the words, the magical words over and over again, there'll be this, you know, special thing that happens. And it's, it's not about a formula. You know, it's not about having all the right words or, or, or bringing the perfect prayer to God. It's about having a heartfelt desire and taking that to God. You know, when the, when the things of life are troubling, are hard or whatever, and instead of sitting there worrying about it, you take it to God. And you keep seeking God about it. And you keep seeking God about it. I think that's the, the key part there. Girl out on a date. You, you, for you, if you remember when you were younger, you know, you, you ask her out, she says no, and then you just never ask anybody else out again, right? Well, no. You were a, teen you were a teenager, so you, you keep on asking. You know, it's the same kind of an idea, you know? Ask so as to get an answer. Now, I'm not saying God's our girlfriend, but you get what I'm saying. With, uh, you know, you keep on asking, and you ask so as to get an answer. Does that kind of make sense? Um, continually praying for something changes your heart on it, too. Yeah. Definitely, definitely does. The longer you pray for something, it's like God will show you different perspectives, and then as the situation changes, you'll be not okay with necessarily, but it'll be easier to deal with the changing situation. Sometimes when we're praying about something, it'll get worse, and get worse, and get worse. And if we're in prayer about it, we'll be able to adapt. We, we, might, get off, we'll, we might get knocked off our, off our feet for a while, but if we stay in prayer, we'll get back up. Just stay in prayer. Mm -hmm. So, okay, that's the first lesson that I think is important here. But the second one uh, actually comes from the exact same passage. So I'm not going to make you turn there again. But, and that's heart trumps content. What if I pray the wrong thing? What if I don't know what to pray? Pray anyways. Don't be afraid that, you know, oh, well, I won't pray the right thing. You probably won't pray, won't pray the right thing. But that's okay, because God can still talk to you. He can still change you. See what I mean? And so if you're afraid that you're going to pray the wrong thing, don't worry about it. Just keep praying. And then, what if I don't know what to pray? A lot of times you don't know what to pray. Pray anyways. And if you remember last week, we looked at the seven types of prayers that, that I brought up from the Lord's Prayer. Um, if you don't know how to pray, just start, start there. You know, just start on a prayer of blessing. Or... Uh, start on, start on, on a prayer of, of, of repentance, of, of, of confession. See what I mean? Start somewhere, but just keep praying. And even if you don't have words, that, not all prayers are prayed with words. You know what I mean? Sometimes prayers are more beneficial when you're just listening. And when you're just being quiet with God. You know what I mean? God's the only one you can ever talk to without saying a word. And then actually get more out of it than if you had talked for forever. <laughs> you can talk to a lot of people and they can come up with a lot of crazy things. Um, your prayers are not to get your own way. Notice how after Jesus says, says each of, this, of these things, he closes off, not my will but yours. Was it God's will for Jesus to die? Yes. If there's any other way that this would not happen, not my will but yours. See what I mean? Was that the right thing to pray? Well, not really, because it wasn't God's will for him to not go through that. See what I mean? Do you see what I'm saying? So right. God's okay with us not having the perfect prayer. Jesus', Jesus prayer doesn't, doesn't show self-confidence or arrogance. You know, he didn't go into it saying, you know, oh, I got this. You know, I, it's fine. It's fine. No, he showed us. See what I mean? He showed us. So does it give everybody kind of understand that? Because you, you give me some blank stares. Moral of the story being here. Um, if you pray the wrong thing, it's all right. Just keep praying. God will show you. In fact, in one part in, in uh, Philippians, Paul's saying, if any of you think anything different, don't worry about it. God will reveal that to you also. In other words, God, in other words, God will show you that you're wrong and help you to think the same way that we should be thinking in Christ. See what I mean? It's kind of the same thing that applies here. Now, I'm, I'm obviously not implying that Jesus was wrong or something. You see what I'm saying? Everything he he lived a sinless life and everything, but the prayer which was recorded for our sake shows that when you are in times of doubt and you don't want to do the thing <laughs> that God is clearly showing you what to do, you still trust it to God. <coughs> um, do not be uh, short with God, 
be submitted to God. Sometimes we get this idea that God has to answer in our way at our time. Does that kind of make sense? Like, yeah. this is just, it has to go out like this. But <clears throat> prayer is more about being submitted to God. If the situation never changes. Like, for instance, for Jesus. The situation was not going to change. He was going to die that, you know, th that's what was going to happen. It was not going to change. But, um, instead of being short with God the Father, or, you know, going on some long dramatic spiel, he instead submitted to God. Because what does he say? I always submit to the Father and everything. Michael, and there's comfort in that. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Good. Not having to have all the answers. <laughs> yeah. Definitely. You know, sometimes we think that we have to be independent, and we think that we have to prove right. something to everybody. You know, if, if I can't make it by myself, then what good am I? But in putting up that false front of having to always have the answers, having to always be right, having to always be self-reliant, you miss out a large bit on God's comfort and direction and purpose in your life because you're too busy trying to get your own purpose in life. Or, God knows your heart. Right. But you better be strong. Better than we do. Yes. Right. Yes. Heart trumps content. Yes, it's not about having the perfect prayer. It's about having the right heart. Right. So the third lesson that Jesus teaches us in prayer, validation comes from God. Now, this is extremely important because a lot of times, <coughs> <coughs> what do we do when people praise us, when people tell us that we did a good job? <coughs> do what? <laughs> yes, definitely. And we kind of respond in two different ways. Yeah, well, you know, it's all God. <laughs> or we go into this other spiel that takes us, like, where we turn it into a sermon, you know. Well, do, 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 yay, verily, and we throw in some King James Version and make it this long, dramatic thing when all they said is, hey, you did a good job. It's like, okay, buddy, calm down. Wind it in a little bit. Well, I don't want to sound arrogant, so now I'm going on this 30-minute sermon about, you know, it. our pride gets us into all kinds of trouble. But with that being said, <laughs> let's look at Luke 5 before I, before I say that name part. Luke chapter 5, and verses 15 through 16. You know what's a great way to respond when people praise you for something good you did? Thank you for encouraging me. Thank you for encouraging me. And just leave it at that. You don't have to have some perfect answer. You don't have to go on and on and on and on. And you don't have to be sure to say every single time, It was God! So that he doesn't strike you with worms and like an axe. That's not the point here, guys. <laughs> That's not the point. It's 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 you know, obviously always give give God the glory in things. But you don't have to have this perfect answer, and you don't have to turn into a sermon. You thank you for your encouragement because that's all they're really intending to do. All all they mean to do is give you encouragement, unless they're trying to manipulate you into getting you on their side so that they can get you to join them in an argument. In which case. Don't get sucked in. Luke chapter 5, verses 15 through 16. But the news about him was spreading even farther, and large crowds were gathering to him and to be healed of their sicknesses. I'm sorry, uh, were gathering to hear him and to be healed of their sicknesses. But Jesus himself would often slip away to the wilderness and pray. You hear, you hear what you just said? People are crowding over him. They're, they're, they're fawning over him. Now, if you are like most people, you would probably relish it. Oh, look at how everybody is coming to me and praising me. And this is Jesus, remember. He's actually deserving of being praised. <laughs> but instead of sitting there rolling in the, in, the, in the adoration of everyone, he separates himself to pray. What did he do when he had a successful day of ministry? He didn't ask, how did I do? He didn't go to his wife and say, wife. How did I do today? He separated himself and went to the Father and made sure he got on the Father's page. <coughs> That's a very important thing that we could all learn from. A very important thing that we could all learn from. And then if you notice the story, this was right after he's been rejected in Nazareth. 
So within the span of just a little while, we have Jesus being rejected and then him being praised. And neither the people rejecting him nor people praising him altered how he acted. John says it like this. He didn't need people to praise him because he knew it was in the hearts of men. So the rejection of man did not stop Jesus just as their praise did not alter his actions. God's approval decided his actions. He lived his life in such constant submission to God that it was about, have I loved you well today? In my ministry, have I glorified you? In what I'm doing, have you been honored? And, and he says this multiple times throughout the Gospels. It was always about, G about God, exalting God the Father. Everything he said, he always said that. I'm, do I'm not doing this for my own glory. I do it for the, for the praise of the Father. He was literally striving for God the Father to glorify him. That was his, stri his striving purpose in life. Now that's saying something. Because remember, before creation, God decided to do this whole plan. People are going to mess up, and then we're going to save them by going and dying on, on a cross for them. Before creation ever was, they had this plan worked out. So this is kind of a big deal here. When people reject you, it hurts, but does it consume you? Does it consume you? Obviously, as long as you're a person, it's going to hurt. None of us like being slapped in the face. <laughs> but with that being said, does it consume you? Your thoughts are always over the people who reject you, always living for somebody to give you a pat on the back. I was at a leadership thing um, a couple weeks ago uh, with a guy named Chris Soxon, and he was having a, a little... Uh, Sidebar, I guess you could say, with anyone who wasn't the senior pastor, so it shows your pastors and stuff like that. And he brought up the thing about a lot of times associate pastors are looking for the senior pastor to give them a pat on the back. And he said, that's not their job to do that. It's complete silence in the room when he said it. <laughs> and then he said, it's also not their job to go out of their way to make you a better leader or to go out of their way to um, teach. I don't want to say it the wrong way because it is the head leadership's job to get his leadership on the same page with them. I'm not saying that, but um, to help, to equip you to do a better job. That's your job. You should be out reading books. You should be out going to conferences and, 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 and reading blogs and, and listening to podcasts. You should be out there learning how to do your job better. And uh, really related to this, and I didn't even think about when I was writing, so how about that? When people praise you, does it encourage you or validate you? Do you draw your being, <coughs> your essence, <coughs> from people praising you? Does it validate you as a Christian and as a person when people praise you? Or does it just encourage you? Because it's only meant to encourage you. If you're seeking for people to praise you, Proverbs says that that's a snare, a trap. When you desire to be praised by people, that's a trap. Because you're living your life for people's approval. Now, I'm not saying you should try to irritate people. <laughs> That's not what I'm saying at all. But you shouldn't be living for people's praise. Lesson number four that, that uh, we can see from Jesus. Respond to life with prayer. In Luke chapter 11, verse 5. And we only have one more lesson after this. It says, Then he said to them, Suppose one of you has a friend, and goes to him at midnight, and says to him, Friend, lend me three loaves. So here he's telling, the, telling this story, often called parables. Um, and it's about this, this guy who goes to another friend because he has an unexpected visitor uh, in the middle of the night. Now, obviously... There's a lot of other things going on about, you know, social customs with being prepared and, you know, um, back then they had the whole hospitality thing, but we're not even going to look at that. That's not even the important thing I want to emphasize. We can't control when things unexpected come up. <coughs> we cannot control when unexpected things come up. That's life. They're going to come up. First response to family news. So, like... Someone's getting a divorce in your family. Um, see where I was called. Something's going on with you know uh, 
your kids are beating on each other or whatever. First response to family news. First res response to political problems. Maybe you heard something on the news that that's, that's upsetting you. Um, maybe you heard something with you know, our current president or something and, and you just, oh, I just can't stand that guy. He's not my president or whatever. Um, maybe, um, maybe you're going, having financial issues. Um, I don't think I have to elaborate on that one, but for those of you who have credit cards, you probably have financial problems because people treat credit cards kind of like they're a, uh, you know, you don't have to worry about it. <laughs> um, okay, uh, and then the last thing, uh, if you're having work difficulties, anything like that, I know, I know a lot of people get real worked up about things like global warming and stuff like that. Um, whatever it is, whatever, whatever the issue is that is bothering you, let the first response be prayer. Let the first response you do be prayer. And look at the par parable that he says here. This guy has an unexpected visitor. What's his first response? He goes and asks. He goes and asks. See what I mean? When we are faced with unexpected problems in life, what is our first response? We go to the Father. We go to the Father. Whatever it is, we go to the Father. If we would learn to address our problems with prayer rather than worrying, we would be a lot better off. Because I've heard a lot of different people say a lot of things about President Trump. I've heard a lot of people say a lot of things about President Obama before him and President uh, Bush before him. But here's the thing. Talking about something and just getting worked up about it, like for instance the president, doesn't resolve anything. But when you take your frustrations and you take that to prayer, then you are changed. See the difference? Or you can get yourself all worked up and, and, and be, and then go on social media and say stupid things to all your friends about how you hate this or that or the other thing. See what I mean? Which thing do you think Jesus would have done? Do you see Jesus ever once sitting down and just criticizing the emperor over and over again to all his friends and all his buddies and posting stupid stuff on, on Twitter? Do you see him doing that? No. You see him out on the streets loving people. He didn't have time to be gossiping about the emperor because he was doing the will of the father. See the difference of perspective there? Face life with prayer. It's always the right time to pray. To pray. Always. You might say, well, I woke up at 3 in the morning, I can't, I can't get back to sleep. So pray. If you're going to sit there tossing and turning, not afraid to, I mean, not able to go to sleep again anyways, then you might as well pray. But he is Father's King of Kings. Right. Yeah. Right. And, uh, you know, if, if, if you're going through something and you, you can't get your mind off it, then at least pray about it. Amen. Well, I can't stop thinking about it. Okay, so pray about it. You'd be surprised how quickly Satan will drop the issue when you keep facing with prayer. If Satan knows he can get you to worry and worry and complain about the issue, then he will help you to worry and complain about the situation because he knows your weaknesses. He sees them. Remember, he's he's and Satan has been alive since before you were born, and he'll be alive after you're dead. He watches you the whole time. He sees what your weaknesses are. He's aware of these things. Obviously, demons can't read our minds, but they can simply watch and observe. Like for instance. It's not that hard to figure out if we have a lust problem or a greed problem. You know, you can just simply look at our credit cards and say, wow, this guy definitely has a financial problem. <laughs> um, prayer is the starting point and after action, the finishing point. The first thing you do, no matter what, face it with prayer. Do whatever God tells you to do, but then the last thing you, have, you do, pray about it. And after you do the thing that God tells you to do, pray about it. What did Jesus do after he had a full day of ministry? Prayed about it. Always take it back to prayer. Start your day with mm -hmm. prayer. Finish it with prayer. Start whatever task God put on your heart with prayer. Finish it with prayer. <coughs> lesson number five. The last <coughs> two lessons that I want to emphasize tonight is Luke chapter 18, verses 1 through 8. Unlike the last parable, we're actually going to read the whole thing here. Now, he was telling them a parable to show that at all times they ought to pray and not to lose heart. Verse 2 saying, in a certain city there was a judge who did not fear God and did not respect man. So basically, a judge that has never existed. Judges are either swayed by men, or they act according to their conscience. You're either going to have a wicked judge or a righteous judge. This judge f fell into neither category. He was just his own thing. He wasn't living for God or men. 
There was a widow in that city, and she kept coming to him, saying, Give me legal protection for my opponent. For a while he was unwilling, but afterward he said to himself, Even though I do not fear God nor respect man, yet because this widow bothers me, I will give her legal protection, otherwise by continually coming, she will wear me out. Another translation says, She'll turn and attack me. Uh, and the Lord said, Hear what the unrighteous judge said. Judge said, Now will not God bring about justice for his elect who cry to him day and night, and will he delay long over them? I tell you that he will bring about justice for them quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? <coughs> God does not enjoy watching you suffer. This question was actually addressed in the book of Job. God, what's the deal here? Are you just, are you just enjoying this? Why do you even postpone my life so that you can just stick me in groaning all day long? In fact, one part even says, God hides justice, and he mocks people who are suffering. Boy, that sounds like a real righteous person there, doesn't it? Have you ever been in pain before? <laughs> so God does not enjoy watching you suffer. God does not willingly punish anyone. Lamentation says this. This is what Lamentation says after the person <coughs> just saw the Babylonians come in and destroy Jerusalem, destroy the temple of God, and the Babylonians also ripped open the pregnant women while they died slowly to death on the ground with their babies dying with them that they could not do anything about. They saw the Babylonians take their infant children and throw them against rocks. They saw the Babylonians completely devastate the Holy Land, the land that was promised to them, they just saw all of this, and what is the response that he writes down in Lamentations? God does not willingly punish anyone. Wow. Now that has to take some kind of revelation from God, because I don't think that's what I would be saying if I just saw all the devastation that the Babylonians brought on Jerusalem. That's just me, though. Uh, I, I've never been in this kind of situation before. Um, God cares about you, and your pain does matter to him. I'm just summarizing what the Bible already says. And by way of reason, if Luke chapter 18 is about an unrighteous judge, then the opposite would be true of God, who is a righteous judge. Just because that's kind of how that format is. He is sovereign. God is, that means God is in control of everything all the time. He is good. That means that he acts according to his character, and in him there is no evil. He's not like the yin-yang, where there's a little bit of evil in him and a whole lot of good. He is pure good. Um, he is all powerful, which means that any time he can do whatever he sets in his heart to do. And he's faithful, which means he ain't quitting you. Right. Unlike the judge in Luke chapter 18. So he's all those things. Now, obviously, the, the question then becomes okay, so if God is sovereign. But there's evil in the world. Doesn't that mean that he's not good? For that I say, read the book of Job. He rewards those who seek him. And in fact, I think it's in Hebrews, he says, you have to come to God. Maybe it's James. Um, believing that he's a rewarder of those who seek him. I think that's Hebrews. It doesn't matter. Um, so, okay, so then in lesson five, be confident of who you pray to. Is this the God that you are praying to in your situation? Are you praying to the faithful God? Are you praying to the good God, the sovereign God, the all-powerful? Are you praying with the realization God is in control of all of this? Are you praying with that in mind? Are you praying with the realization that God is faithful? And even though you're fed up with the situation, God isn't fed up with you. Right. Are you praying with that? So just in summary of the, of the five lessons here. Let me make sure I didn't skip that. No, okay. Lesson one, keep asking. Lesson two, heart trumps content. If you don't have the right words, you just keep seeking God with your whole heart, and he will overlook the stupidity that you pray <laughs> because you came to him with a pure heart. Lesson number three, like for instance, what I mean by that is in the book of Job, Job oftentimes did not say the right thing. Right. Job oftentimes said something that was a little stupid. <coughs> However... <coughs> he came to God and he trusted in God and even though he was in ex extreme pain he trusted in God mm -hmm. okay. and at the end of the book who was validated? Job lesson number three validation comes from God 
not by people praising you or rejecting you. Lesson number four, respond to life with prayer. And lesson number five, be confident in who you pray to. And I just want to say this. I'm going to have two closing slides, but before I go to that, if your work is God's work, it won't die with you. If your work is God's work, it won't die with you. We all want to leave something for our kids, for our grandkids. We all want to establish something that really mattered. We want to spend our life doing something that we can say, hey, I was here. I did something. Well, if your work is God's work, it won't die with you. It won't. So the first thing, as parents and as parents and grandparents, it is your responsibility to teach your kids about God and grandkids uh, about God and how to pray more so than being a perfect parent. If you look at, I mean, any kind of psychology stuff today, it's always about how you can be the perfect parent. Don't say this. Don't do this. Do this. Don't do that. And over and over again, trying to be the perfect parent so that hopefully our kids won't mess up because we were perfect. Well, newsflash, you're not going to be a perfect parent. You are going to make mistakes. And in the end, you will have made yourself even more frustrated. And your kids will have this idea that your whole purpose is to serve them, which it's not. I'm not saying you shouldn't try to be a good parent and you shouldn't try to do better today than you did yesterday. But with that being said, your responsibility more so than being a perfect parent is to teach your kids to pray and to teach them to obey God. Did you do that? Did you do that? Well, no, I didn't. I really messed up in the past. Well, what are you doing today? What are you doing today to show people pray and obey God? <clears throat> your ministry didn't stop because your kids grew up. I mean, you're not dead. The idea that, that, that this world has no place for the elderly is completely against what the Bible says. <coughs> and the Bible shows time and time again that everyone had a purpose by God, even to the point of their death. Remember that. In fact, some people in the Bible... Their death was also an important part for God to use them. So don't forget that either. More so than being a perfect parent, it is your job to teach your kids and your grandkids about God and how to pray. And the last thing, for you, it is your responsibility for you to learn how to pray. And then to be always in prayer. Have a, pray, a praying life. See what I mean? Mm -hmm. Be a Christian who prays. Because I, I, I guarantee you this, Christians who do not pray will soon discover that there is no power to overcome the darkness in this world. Mm -hmm. I promise you that. But a Christian who prays will find that there is always power. Mm -hmm. Always power. Never, ever underestimate the power of God. We're going to go ahead and close there. Um, if I can have... Uh, yeah, you can go ahead. Um, if I can...